I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. In the last episode, I picked up with more stories from the Hurrian Kumarbi cycle. These cycle myths may have not actually formed a series of chronological episodes, but archaeologists tend to order them that way. It's possible, instead, that they were a series of interconnected stories, a bunch of Kumarbi's attempts at fighting Teshub, but with no real order. However, the Song of Hidamu, which I talked about last episode, does flow very well into this next myth, called the Song of Ulakumi. So it's likely that even if every Kumarbi story wasn't put in a specific order, at least some of them were. The Song of Birth, for example, obviously goes before all the others. Last episode, the god Teshub was forced to fight a handful of opponents for the throne of heaven. These opponents were set against him by his father, and the old king in heaven, Kumarbi. One of Kumarbi's allies was the sea god Kiyashi. There's evidence of a missing story that features a fight between Teshub and the sea god himself. However, in the Song of Hidamu, the sea god enters into a secret alliance with Kumarbi. Kumarbi marries the sea god's daughter, and she gives birth to his son, Hidamu. Hidamu was a monstrous sea serpent, and he was the most effective opponent fighting against Teshub so far. The day was saved when the goddess Shoshka, Teshub's sister, seduces Hidamu, gets him drunk with a love potion, and coaxes him out of his hiding place in the sea. With Hidamu now vulnerable, Teshub kills him, and Kumarbi's plans are defeated again. But rest assured, he will soon be up to his old tricks. Our next myth, the Song of Ulakumi, returns with much the same cast of characters. Our divine siblings, Teshub, Tashmishu, and the goddess Shoshka, are the main celestial gods. But the sun god Shemij and Teshub's wife Habat are going to make an appearance too. Kumarbi, ever the crafty, wily coyote character, is back, and again is helped by his ally, the sea god Kiyashi. The monster of this myth is Ulakumi, and he gives us the name of the story. And then we will have the old gods, the god Ea, who will again prove to be very important. But there will also be an appearance by two fate goddesses, an old fed-up god named Enlil, who lives in the underworld, and a dutiful giant named Ubaluri, who holds up the earth. That intro is just to prime you on some of the names. The Song of Ulakumi once again begins with Kumarbi, father of the gods. Kumarbi is in his audience chamber, within his palace in his sacred city, Urkesh. He sits on his throne, brooding, no doubt trying to come up with another plan to take on his archenemy, Teshub. Kumarbi raises an evil day, meaning he devises a clever plan, that will take Teshub unawares. Kumarbi plans to use a hostile man as a rival to fight against Teshub. As we have already heard, this is not a new plan for Kumarbi. In fact, raising up rivals to fight against Teshub on his behalf seems to almost be a go-to move for Kumarbi. But nevertheless, Kumarbi has a plan, and he rises from his throne. He grabs his walking stick, puts the swift winds on his feet, wearing them like winged shoes, and he goes traveling, departing from Urkesh. Kumarbi arrives at a place called Cold Spring. This is likely a real place, like Van in eastern Turkey. At Cold Spring, there was a large, rocky cliff. Kumarbi looked the cliff up and down. He saw what it had below the ground, and, well, he liked what he saw. He slept with the cliff. He had sex with the cliff five times, and then another ten times. Kumarbi got the cliff pregnant, and now, satisfied, he took up his walking stick again, put the winds on his shoes, and departed. Months pass, and Kumarbi goes to visit his old ally, the sea god. Kiyashi, the sea god, saw him approach and ordered his servants to prepare to welcome Kumarbi. The sea spoke, place a stool for Kumarbi to sit, and then place a table in front of him bring to him food to eat and beverages to drink. The cooks brought delicious stews, while the cupbearers brought sweet wine. Kumarbi and Kiyashi sat down together. They drank once, they drank twice, they drank three times, four times, five times, six times, and then seven times. They must have enjoyed the meal and gotten quite drunk. Why? Well, they had cause to celebrate. Kumarbi's lover, the cliff at Cold Spring, gave birth to Kumarbi's child either in the sea or in Kumarbi's own palace. The fate goddesses served as midwives for the cliff. The child was born, and the fate goddesses lifted him up and carried him to Kumarbi's knees. 
Kumar B bounced the baby on his lap, amusing his newborn son and making the baby smile. And then it's time for serious business. Kumar B sat the baby upright on his lap and wondered out loud what he should name him. It did not take him long. He names the baby boy Ulakumi, which means destroyer of Kumi. Kumi is the home of the god and current king of the universe, Teshub. Kumarbi then declares that Ulakumi will crush the city of Kumi until it is flat. He will strike down Teshub, grind him up, and crush him under his foot like an ant. Kumarbi also declares that Ulakumi will break Teshub's brother Tashmishu like a broken reed, scatter all the other gods down from heaven, and then shatter them on the ground. And then, with that destruction complete, and the gods defeated beyond doubt, Ulakumi will rise to be king in heaven. But Teshub and the heavenly gods are safe for the time being. All that destruction is in the future. In the meantime, Ulakumi is still a newborn baby. After declaring this sinister prophecy for Ulakumi, Kumarbi wonders who he should give his child to to raise. Kumarbi asks, who will take him and treat him as a gift? Who will take him into the dark earth? The sun god Shemij of heaven and Kushu the moon must not see him. Tesha, the heroic king of Kumi, must not see him either, nor should the goddess Shashka, queen of Nineveh, see him. If any of these gods become aware of the baby Ulakumi and the danger he poses, they will kill him, and Kumarbi's plan will fall apart. Kumarbi knows what to do. He gets his attendant, Impaluri, to go get the fate goddesses again and bring them to him. Impaluri finds them and tells them to hurry. The fate goddesses make the trip in one go, and when they arrive... Kumarbi tells them to take the baby down to the dark earth, the underworld, for him. Kumarbi tells them to place the baby on the shoulder of a giant named Ubaluri. Ubaluri is a being that lives in the dark earth. He has one very important job. Ubaluri stands in the underworld and holds up the earth. Kumarbi tells the fate goddesses to place the baby Ulakumi on the shoulder of Ubaluri, and then just sit back and let the baby grow bigger. So, the fate goddesses take our sweet little future destroyer of heaven. They lift up the child and hug him close to their chests. They take him down to the dark earth in secret, avoiding the prying eyes of the other gods and goddesses. But before they take Ulakumi to Ubaluri, they make a side trip. The fate goddesses first take him to Enlil, an old god who also lives in the underworld. Like with Kumarbi when Ulakumi was born, they put the baby on the knees of Enlil. Enlil plays with the baby, bouncing him up and down, and he notices something very strange about Ulakumi. The baby's body is made completely from basalt stone. Enlil asks, Who is this child? Who have the fate goddesses and mother goddesses raised again? Who can bear any longer the intense struggles of the great gods? This evil plan can only be Kumarbi's. Just as he raised Teshub, he has raised this stone man to be Teshub's replacement. Needless to say, Enlil is not impressed, and with that, the fate goddesses take Ulakumi back from Enlil and go place him on Ubaluri's right shoulder. And up on Ubaluri's shoulder, Ulakumi is safe and hidden and ready to grow. And Ulakumi did grow, by a lot, and quickly. He grew more every day. After 15 days, he was so big he stuck out of the sea, with the water up to his knees and the sea swirling around him. At that point, the sun god Shemij looks down from heaven. He sees Ulakumi, and Ulakumi looks right back at him. Shemij wonders, what god is that standing in the sea? He notices the god's body does not look like other gods. So Shemij goes down to the sea. He holds his hand up to his forehead to help him get a better look. He gets a better look of Ulakumi, and knows that he means trouble. Later, Teshub and Tashmishu are in their palace, and they see Shemij approaching. They talk to each other about why Shemij is on his way. Why would he leave the sky? They decide that it must be an important reason, and that they should not ignore Shemij and send him away. They decide to set up a chair for Shemij and prepare food for their coming visitor. So Shemij arrives at the palace, and then we have a familiar scene. Teshub and Tashmishu give him a chair, but Shemij doesn't sit. They show him a table covered in delicious food, but Shemij doesn't reach for any of it. They give him a cup, but Shemij doesn't drink from it. Teshub turns to him and asks, Is the chair uncomfortable? Is the food bad? Shemij tells Teshub and Tashmiju what he saw standing in the ocean, and then afterwards, he does sit down, 
he eats fine bread, drinks sweet wine, and then when he is full, with his message already given, he leaves and goes back up to heaven. After Shemij departs, Teshub and Tashmiju take each other by the hand and depart their house. They are joined by the heroic goddess Shashka, and the three of them join hands and climb Mount Hazi. At the top of the mountain, Teshub looks out, and even so far away, he can see the dreadful stone man Ulakumi standing tall out of the ocean. Disturbed by what he sees, Teshub sat on the ground and began to cry. His tears flowed down his face like canals carrying water for irrigation. Weeping, Teshub asks, who can look at the destruction caused by this one any longer? Who can go on fighting? Who can look at the terrors of this one again? But Shashka tries to comfort her brother, telling him that Ulakumi is strong, but stupid. She says, this stone man doesn't have any cleverness, even though he has received heroism tenfold. If I were a man, I would set you right, but I will go and help you. There is a large gap in the text. But when it resumes, Shashka is preparing herself, so presumably she left Mount Hazi and went to her own palace. What follows is another familiar scene. In the Song of Hadamu, Shashka was successful in using seduction to weaken the sea serpent. She will now try and use the same strategy on Ulakumi. In her own palace in Nineveh, Shashka dresses herself in fine clothes and jewelry. She adorns herself with sweet oils and fragment perfumes. She lights and carries burning incense. She takes her lyre and cymbals in hand, leaves her house, and travels to the sea to find Ulakumi. As she goes, Shashka strums a melody on the lyre. She shakes her gold bangles and bracelets. Shashka begins to sing, and all of heaven and earth begin to sing in response. But as she walks along the beach, a great wave rises out of the water. And as this wave rolls by, it begins to talk to Shashka. The wave asks the goddess, Why are you singing? For whose benefit are you filling your mouth with wind? Ulukumi is deaf, he cannot hear. He is blind, he cannot see. He has no compassion. Go away, Shashka. Go find your brother before Ulukumi grows too strong, before the skull of his head becomes too hard to break. Hearing that, Shashka loses her mojo. She extinguishes the cedar incense she is burning, and she throws her lyre, cymbals, and gold jewelry on the ground. She wipes her eyes, and tearfully sets out to return to Teshub. There is another gap in the text, but Shashka must have found Teshub and Tashmishu and told them the bad news. Teshub is forced to get a grip and prepare to fight Ulakumi himself. When the text resumes, Teshub is preparing his chariot, which also doubles as a thundercloud. Teshub told Tashmishu to prepare his bull-drawn chariot. He said, let the servants mix fodder for the bulls to eat. Let them bring sweet oil to anoint their horns, and plate their tails with gold. When Tashmishu heard the words of Teshub, he hurried, he hastened. First he went and brought the bull Sherry from the pasture. Then he went and got Teshub's other bull, Tela, from Mount Imgara. Tashmishu had sweet oil brought out and anointed the horns of the bull Sherry. He plated the tail of the bull Tela with gold. The servants brought out Teshub's chariot and spun the wheel axles. Finally, they summoned thunder and called for the rains and winds. And lightning, that awesome weapon of the gods, was brought out from storage in Teshub's bedroom. Now ready, Teshub gathered his tools of war and mounted the chariot. He brought the clouds out from heaven. Teshub sets his eyes on the great basalt Ulakumi and sets off. Ulakumi had grown even bigger. I would like to describe the battle between Teshub and Ulakumi, but unfortunately, we now have another large break in the tablets recording this story. This break is approximately 30 lines long, a pretty significant chunk. It likely would have featured Teshub riding his chariot, surrounded by storm clouds and twisting gale force winds, as he went down to the sea to fight Ulakumi, and Ulakumi actually defeating him. This great battle may have featured other gods as well. When the tablet is readable, and the story continues, another god, one called Ashtabi, is named. Ashtabi was another ancient Middle Eastern god. He was another storm god, and he was worshipped in the area of northern Syria around this period too. The gods also prepare a chariot for Ashtabi, and hand it over. He rides in it too, thundering as he goes down towards the sea. Seventy gods accompanying him bailed at the last minute, and Ashtabi was unsuccessful. Ashtabi and those same seventy gods were all knocked down into the sea. I suspect that the battle between Ulakumi and Teshub went in a similar way, 
and what we have here is a repeat attempt by another thunder god from the Hurian world. Meanwhile, Ulukumi continues to grow larger and more powerful. He makes the heavens tremble, and tears them open like an old piece of clothing. Ulukumi now stands a full 9,000 miles tall. Ulukumi arrives at the city gates of the god city of Kumi. In the city, at her temple, is the wife of Teshub, a goddess named Habat. Ulukumi is so tall, he undoubtedly blocks out the sun. But we are also told something even more extreme. Ulukumi is so big, he blocks the prayers and messages of the gods from even reaching the goddess Habat. She looks out her temple window, but is unable to see Teshub or Tashmishu anywhere. Back inside, Habat turns to one of her servants, a goddess named Takiti. Habat says she can't hear the words of Teshub, or the messages from Tashmishu, or any of the other gods. She points to a large mass of Ulukumi outside the city. This one, she says, has he perhaps defeated my husband? So the wife of Teshub gives Takiti instructions. She tells her to take a staff, put the winged winds on her feet like shoes, and go find out if Teshub was killed. Probably frightened and thinking, I don't want to go out there, Takiti leaves. She hurries, she hastens, but eventually she finds out that there is no path at all. She can't leave the city. Ulakumi has them surrounded. Takiti returned to Habat, and it appears begins to tell her mistress the bad news. But then there is another break in the tablet, so we miss her explanation, and presumably a scene of Habat climbing up into a tall watchtower to look out, pacing back and forth with worry, and tearing her hair out in frustration. As it happens, when readability returns, we have a pleasant surprise. Teshub and Tashmishu are not dead after all. Tashmishu himself arrives in Kumi, carrying his staff and wearing the winged winds as shoes. He climbs up the tower stairs and stands in front of Habat. He tells her, Teshub orders me to go to the narrow confines of the grave until he completes the years decreed for him. It's an odd way of saying, relax lady, Teshub ain't dead. Habat was so surprised she actually fell over, and she almost fell off the roof of the watchtower, but her maids fortunately grabbed her before she could fall. Message delivered, Tashmishu returns to Teshub at an undisclosed location. They discuss their next move. Tashmishu wonders if they should relocate to another mountain, Mount Kandura or Mount Lalapadua. Should they set up a government in exile, and let there be no king in heaven at all? Tashmishu must have realized how unacceptable that idea actually is, because he very quickly abandons it and comes up with a better one. Teshub, he says, listen to my words. Hold your ear turned to my words. Let's go to the city Abzu, where Ea rules. Then we will ask Ea about the tablets of ancient words. We will ask him for help. Perhaps we will be pleasing to Ea. Perhaps he will listen, and he will be merciful to us, and he will hand over to us the ancient tablets. So Teshub and Tashmishu rise up from their chairs, took each other by the hand, and set out to Abzu. They arrived at the house of Ea. The brothers bowed five times at the front doors and were let in. They bowed five more times at the inner doors and continued on. Finally, they arrived at Ea's audience chamber, and, standing in front of Ea, they bowed another fifteen times. You can see that Ea gets a lot of respect from the other Hittite gods. Ea calls Teshub to come closer. Teshub runs forward and falls down in front of the old wise god. Teshub kisses Ea's knees three times, and then he kisses Ea's feet four times, and then he gets up and the two embrace. The tablets become unreadable again, but we can guess that Teshub and Tashmishu explain the situation with Ulukumi to Ea, and tell him about how the gods will soon be destroyed if he does not intervene. They likely ask him about those tablets of ancient wisdom, too. Now, what exactly are these? Well, they are essentially a super weapon. To understand what these tablets are, let me tell you a little more about Ea. As I've mentioned, Ea is not originally a Hittite or Hurrian god. Instead, he belongs to the myths of earlier Middle Eastern cultures that inspired the stories told by the Hittites, Hurrians, and others in some ways. The name Ea is actually from ancient Babylonia. He goes all the way back to the myths told in the city-states of Akkad and Sumer, the first civilization to rise up in Iraq, and one of the oldest in the whole world. In those older stories, Ea is like, in the Hurrian stories, a very wise and powerful god, but he is also the keeper of special tablets that have the destiny of the world 
and the various divine decrees on how the world works written on them. These tablets give control of the world too, almost like a powerful spellbook, and they are actually stolen, reclaimed, and used by different gods and figures in those older myths to gain power. So, when Teshub and Tashmishu are asking Ea about the ancient tablets, they are hoping he will give the tablets to them, and they will be able to use their magic powers to defeat Ulukumi. But Ea probably considers giving them the tablets to be one step too far. Instead, Ea does agree to help them, but now takes on the role of detective. Ea stands up and goes out into the courtyard. He goes to the Dark Earth, the Underworld, and finds another old god named Enlil. Ea asks Enlil, Do you not know Enlil? Do you know the rival Kumarbi has created against Teshub, who matured in the ocean and who is now 9,000 miles in height? We don't know Enlil's reply, but he may have given Ea a clue. Afterwards, Ea continues on to find the giant Ubaluri. Ubaluri opens his eyes and greets Ea enthusiastically, and Ea returns the greeting and asks him a similar line of questioning to what he asked Enlil. Do you not know of the rapidly growing god Kumarbi created to fight against the gods? Kumarbi seeks the death of Teshub, and this rival matured in the water and shot up. He has blocked off heaven and the pure temples. Ubaluri, did you not know? And Ubaluri replies, When heaven and earth were built on top of me, I didn't notice anything, and when the gods cut apart heaven and earth with the copper Karuza tool, I didn't notice anything either. But now, Ea... Something hurts my shoulder, and I do not know who this god is. So Ea turns away from Ubaluri, and looks over at his right shoulder. And sure enough, who is standing on the shoulder of the giant Ubaluri, the giant who had the heaven and earth built on top of him? Why, it was none other than Ulukumi. And with that, Ea determines what the problem is. The reason Ulukumi grew so strong and so tall so fast is because he was standing on the shoulder of Ubaluri. And if he can be removed from Ubaluri, then Ulukumi should become vulnerable once again. So Ea calls out to the other gods. He tells them to go and open the ancient fatherly, grandfatherly storehouse, and to bring out the seal of their ancestors and unseal the storehouse with it. Ea tells them to go into the storehouse, to take out the ancient Karuza cutting tool, either a copper saw or sickle, which the former gods used to cut apart heaven and earth. Ea tells them that they are going to use this cutting tool, to cut Ulukumi at his feet, separating him from Ubaluri forever and causing him to lose strength. There is another large gap in the text. Within it, Ea uses the cutting tool to separate Ulukumi from Ubaluri. In the process, he cracks open the earth and is able to view the dead souls in the underworld. When the text resumes, Ea speaks to Tashmishu. Go forth, my son. Don't stand in front of me. Inside me, my mind is sickened because I have seen with my own eyes the dead of the dark earth. They stand like dust and ashes. First, I routed Ulukumi. Now go fight him again. Don't let him stand at the gates of Kumi any longer. Tashmishu heard Ea's words and rejoiced. Tashmishu clapped three times. Up in the sky, the gods heard. He clapped a second time, and Teshub heard. The gods all gathered at the place of assembly, and all together began bellowing at Ulukumi. Teshub leapt up into his chariot and rode down to the sea armed with thunder once again. He fights Ulukumi once again. His actual victory is cut off by the tablet once again. But the fight does include an exchange of dialogue between Ulukumi and Teshub, and Ulukumi's words remain. He tells Teshub to keep attacking, for Ea, king of wisdom, is on his side. Ulukumi seems to know that while it was his destiny to scatter the gods down from the sky, destroy Kumi and take the kingship in heaven, with Ea on the side of Teshub, it is only a matter of time before he, Ulukumi, is defeated. So Teshub, with Ea's help, defeats the dreaded Ulukumi. Once again, Kumarbi's attempt to remove Teshub from power is defeated. That, anyway, is the end of the Song of Ulukumi, and with it, the end of the Kumarbi cycle. We don't know what, if anything, happens to Kumarbi. Maybe he stopped with his attempts at defeating Teshub. Maybe there were more. We simply do not have enough surviving Hurrian literature to be sure. What is known is that Teshub remained king in heaven, 
and since he was the most important god of the Hurrians, he was never permanently deposed. But while Kumarbi is the villain of the cycle, he was not some evil devil dark lord figure in Hurrian mythology. Worship of Kumarbi was very widespread, and he was considered wise, powerful, and had something to do with grain, too. His cult even continued for centuries after the golden years of the Hurrians were long over. And that's all for today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please get the word out and tell your friends. Thank you for listening.